hello and welcome to Design Education Talks from New Art School. Our guest today is Fraser Muggridge. Welcome, Fraser. Thank you. It's fantastic to have you here. Good to be here. Thank you for inviting me. It's wonderful. So tell us about you and your work. I'm a typographic designer. Uh, I run a studio in London called Fraser Muggridge Studio, and um, we're primarily working with typography. That can be uh, printed matter, it can be, uh, you know, websites can be online, but really we're interested in type and the combination of type and image. And I also uh, have taught at various uh, institutions, uh, universities, you know, in England and throughout the world. So I'm currently uh, a visiting professor at the University of Arts in Reykjavik in Iceland, and I'm also a professor of graphic design at Leeds Beckett. So I, um, I suppose I'm moving more into the kind of research world and doing projects, uh, slightly moving away from, um, you know, kind of cold face teaching, uh, which I've done for a long time, but I combine that very much with a studio practice. That's wonderful. So tell us how you got into teaching. Well, I studied at uh, Reading University typography and graphic communication in the nineties. And, um, when I started uh, my own studio back in 2001, um, I really just suggested a project to the department. You know, I, I, I felt at home in my, uh, for me, my education was very much a kind of family, uh, close uh, community. So I felt very um, comfortable about going back and teaching at the same place that I'd been to, you know, six or seven years before. So I suggested a project and that project was a project called Creative Economy, which was um, the student had an A2 sheet of paper and they had to make, you know, a poster and a booklet at the same time in a, in a kind of creative economical way. Uh, and really, it just really grew from from that one project. But it's it started with me just suggesting it to the department which is always the best way to, to find work and to find jobs is, is not to answer an ad in a newspaper, is to suggest it to, to people that you know or don't know. And then, and then from there, what happened from, from that project? Uh, I suppose that project I did uh, pretty much obsessed, well, not obsessed, but, you know, th this was 20, 20 years ago. And I really, evenly, I was, I was still quite young and I didn't have any teacher training experience or anything. And I felt that, I wanted to make all the students like me in terms of what they designed and what, how they approached and what things looked. And I think slowly over time, I've realized that um, that's really not a great uh, way to teach. And I've evolved into maybe trying to empower students with knowledge or process rather than um, trying to make everyone do the stuff that I would like to do and i suppose it's evolved through um teaching on the ma book design and then really starting my own um kind of teaching and sort of enterprise which is called typography summer school which was or still is an independent summer school separate from any university or or institution establishment and um or um this started in 2010 and I used to have a lot of uh, applications for designers uh, at, the, at the studio where I worked. And I really felt that there was a basic understanding of typography missing and from a practical point of view. So really, I, I kind of remember sitting in an airport, uh, coming back from a trip to India, giving a talk. And I, I wrote a whole sort of schedule on a, on a sheet of paper at, uh, Delhi airport. And it was really just, you know, what would happen if you got 25 people in a room for a week, I felt that I was able to teach them something that they might not get from their university. I felt that bringing in different, a tutor every day would uh, uh, expand their horizon. So you wouldn't be too locked into one way of designing. And I felt that bringing people from different schools together, you know, would be an interesting kind of network. And I was really surprised that from the first year we had students coming from, you know, New Zealand, you know, I was like amazed that for the first 
summer school, someone came from New Zealand. I was like, I thought it would be, you know, just national, you know, just UK based. But really people came from all over the world to, you know, tie it into, you know, independent learning. And uh, it kind of caught a moment and uh, it's really gone on from there to be um, held in uh, New York since 2013, along with uh, another design studio called Other Means. I've also done editions in LA and in uh, Melbourne. But what I think is interesting about it, it's, it's sort of, it's an antidote to a lot of design education at the moment, which feels quite corporate and cold and big numbers. You know, it's very much homemade. It's very small scale. There's only 25 people. Uh, there's a the chairs are kind of begged and borrowed and the tables are stuck together with, you know, kind of masking tape and sort of homemade. And it has a kind of uh, workshop, lo-fi quality, which is very, you know, different to, yeah, the slick uh, university education that, that a student might get in a, in a sort of undergraduate world. So it's, it's a different kind of thing. And really it's about, a lot of it's about the network. It's about the network of people that people meet. And, you know, there's, there's so much uh, education, you know, I'm very much a believer in, in uh, tacit education is the things that you can't really define or understand or grade or um, define. And you know, for me, when I was a student, those conversations in the corridor with, uh, you know, a professor or a tutor or a visiting person was so uh, enlightening and so useful for me. And I, and I wanted to bring back that kind of things around the work. So they might happen when we're having a group lunch or coffee or, you know, just, just being involved and being in a room together. That's wonderful. So how has this workshop evolved, evolved over the years? Uh, much being, I suppose it's just been, it's expanded to other countries. It's expanded to, like I said, New York um, in 2013. In terms of, you know, uh, the diversity of people that come, it's involved in the diversity of tutors that get invited to speak. Uh, and I feel it's got, um, you know, people put it on their CV or they're very proud to... Um, have done the course and you know they often um say that you know some well-known designers now have have done the summer school back in the day like uh the the two guys that run actual source in america did it in 2013 2014 so they now support that we're trying to work on uh actual source and some other couple of people providing a scholarship to enable people to um uh get scholarships to be able to go there uh from kind of less affluent families so we're trying to kind of mix that up a little bit that's, that sounds that sounds amazing uh so tell us about you talk about research mm. or any other projects that you're currently doing tell us about that so as part of my phd i i completed my phd in 2021 uh, at RMIT, which is in uh, Melbourne, Australia. Uh, the title was A Knowing Wrongness. And it really looks at uh, this kind of inbuilt imperfections within graphic design and how that's a counterpoint to uh, maybe a lot of slick and cold and graphic design that you see. Uh, so my research looked at uh, various figures. So, for example, one of the figures that I looked at is very briefly in the PhD was a uh, printmaker uh, and designer called Eugene Feldman from America. Uh, he ran a commercial printers called Falcon Press is in Philadelphia in the kind of 50s and 60s. And he was able to really experiment with printmaking. He was really able to experiment with pre-press printing, post-press printing and printing on the press itself because he was essentially the owner of the printing company so this was a very unique position to be a an artist and a designer and an owner of the printers so um and he made lots of you know experiments like i said before printing whilst printing and post printing so 
really, he's a person that really talked about. Um, so my research is looking into the kind of uh, his legacy and trying to bring that to uh, an audience and really t in the aim of, uh, you know, a publication and an, ex and an exhibition. The other person that I'm very much interested in, and this is a research project that I'm doing in Iceland with two colleagues, uh, the graphic design work of Dieter Rott. So Dieter Rott was, um, I think, originally a German, a German uh, designer who uh, spent a year in Copenhagen in the late 50s and fell in love with an Icelandic woman, uh, moved with her to Iceland, started a family, and really made a lot of graphic design or produced a lot of graphic design to support his family. And he obviously went on to make a lot of art books and become very successful as an artist. And the project we're trying to do is to try and to um, identify and um, reposition his to a new audience. And I suppose we're trying to uh, look at the his impact on bringing modernism or modernistic graphic design um, to Iceland. But obviously it's a very hard process because when you search for Dieter Rott, you see a lot of his artist books or his works, his prints. So it's really hard to find his... Uh, graphic design outputs that could be, you know, cinema tickets, or uh, I think he might have even done some fish can suit in Iceland. Um, so it, a lot of that comes through uh, talking to people and really trying to uh, jog people's memory because this is now 50, 60 years ago. So that's another big project that I'm involved in, which is Dieter Rock. Hmm. That's, that's very interesting. Mm. And how has your research, how have you found your research to, inf to, be, to have informed your teaching? Uh, well, I suppose you know, I've done a few projects where, you know, I'm interested in uh, playing with the press or a dialogue with the press. Um, so really personal projects, studios, problem, and those projects have usually been in the educational environment that has a litho press. So it's very hard to do that in a commercial environment. So teaching has given me that opportunity to make these experiments, to run courses with students, to sort of enable this sort of trial and error on a press that wouldn't naturally happen. And of course, you know, my practice of making books, of being very precise and rigorous of typography has also, through typography summer school, has also fed into my teaching practice. So really it's a kind of uh, very much a kind of double-edged process of teaching well really primarily studio practice secondary research and thirdly teaching and that's a kind of three-way uh feedback loop that kind of goes round and round and round i don't think anything could exist without the other i'm not a full-time studio um designer but i'm also not not a full-time um researcher and i'm not a full-time teacher i'm kind of I'm a kind of amateur, shambolic person of all of them, but together that brings something unique. <laughs> so what do you see in the future of employment for your students? Interesting, actually. You know, I often, you know, ask students, um, how many, you know, you're here because you want to be graphic designers. You know, put your hands up if you want to be. And I'm, I'm actually sometimes quite surprised how some people might study graphic design and they actually don't really want to be a graphic designer. They've either ended up there or, they feel that some form of education is good and they've just kind of don't really want to be a graphic designer. And I find that quite sad. Um, no one's like that at all, but I, I see that happens more and more. I think there's, there's obviously many, many, many possibilities. It depends obviously what country you're in, what city you're in. I feel that there's lots of opportunities, especially, you know, in, in, in the UK, we're very much, the creative industry, the creative industries is, is really one of our biggest selling points. You know, one of our biggest exports, that and music, you know, we're, we're very good at, we're, we're good at being creative, I feel. Um, and of course, you know, when you're a student, you maybe have an idea of what you want to do, but you, you follow your path and, you know, there's so many different routes. You can go to a big company, 
can be involved in a big structured company, which I think is interesting to some degree. You can work in a really small studio where you, you know, have to do everything from taking stuff to the photocop uh, you know, photocopier or post office. That's what I did when I first started or, or cleaning. Um, or you can work in different areas. You can work in, you know, you can work in advertising, you can work in book design, you can work in TV, you can work in animation, you can obviously work in website design. And so there's a lot more, <coughs> I think it's opened up a lot. And I suppose that opening up is great because there's so much choice, but also it's sometimes a bit overwhelming where, you know, people then, can't decide what to do and you can't be good at everything. So I feel that I've always very much specialized in lettering and typography. And, you know, through that specialism, that's enabled me to, I don't know, work in uh, film titles, which I still use the same basic ideas of typography or book design or album cover design. I still approach the same, uh, each one with the same rigor. Um, but I do feel it's a bit daunting for students um, when you're you know, deciding what to do. But I, I feel you shouldn't really decide what you should do. You should just try a few things out in your 20s and you, this sort of natural path will occur. Brilliant. Um, how does technology impacting in the employment, Sorry? Of, young, employment of young designers? Okay. You know, technology is a sort of double-edged sword for me. It's on one hand, you know, it, it makes everything uh faster quicker easier to do and more efficient less labor intensive less time so these are kind of potentially good things um and lots of things that you know especially in my uh you know making a big book or designing lots of text if you can automate certain things that you don't have to do manually line by line hand by hand that's that's a sort of efficient use of technology but of course if you're unaware how to use technology or uh, i feel that you know clients uh, very rarely hand over content now in one go they were never handed it in one go or it's all drip fed it's all slightly confused of where things are and, you know, this kind of organizational standards or structure of technology, I feel is a bit lost. And, you know, the amount of times, you know, I was teaching last week in Iceland and the amount of times a designer would show me their work after many days and the file was still called untitled and not saved. You know, I was pretty shocked. And there's this kind of... Uh, belief that everything is auto saved and it's in the cloud, but actually no one knows where it is. So I feel this kind of management of data is a big problem uh, with this sort of constant backing up, but no one really knows where everything is. Where, where I am maybe feel that, you know, I just want one file and it's the artwork. I don't want 25,000 files. Brilliant. So you've created your own course and, and that's yes. very inspiring. What would you say to the universities what are the lessons? Because the whole thing, the whole point is to do education differently. What are the lessons from your course that universities could apply in order to improve? I suppose it, it sort of reminds me of, a, of, a, of, a, of an article that I'm just going to quote to you, written by John Patrick Hartner, which was the, uh, an eye review for a really great book uh, written by David Rainford called A New Program for Graphic Design. And his in his review of this he starts with this sentence which i think sums up education in, in the uk which i'll quote it reads art and design pedagogy generally agreed today on the imperative for educators to facilitate independent learning <coughs> instead of instructing students but there remains wide debate about the most effective ways to achieve this goal take from that is there's there's a drive for learn themselves and not really train in certain aspects of design. And there, there are obviously, there are many, many, many advantages to teaching students how to think creatively. 
But if you can think creatively, but you can't actually produce anything, then I think that's a problem. So I feel that, and I suppose it's expected to learn this stuff. And of course, people can pick up, you know, various softwares, but it's a bit like driving a car. You might eventually learn how to drive a car by just getting in and sort of figuring it out and smashing a bit and going down the road. But really, ultimately, you need, you need someone to sit next to you to shout at you for uh, a week, uh, a, a half an hour every week for six months. Um, so I feel that, but at the same time, graphic design is not just about being a software operator. So there's this kind of gray area. And I feel that process and the act of making and the act of on university courses that have projects that are much more aligned to what would be uh, work when people leave university. So for example, uh, at Reading, there was a program called Real Jobs. So you'd have a really small little job in the fourth year or third year. Yeah, very small. It would be a business card or a you know, little leaflet or, you know, and you're required to do that. I think you still are required to do that. And what I learned from that was how to uh, ask for a quote from a printer, how to write a spec, how to uh, uh, talk to a client that isn't a designer, how to uh, make changes, how to manage conflict, how to respond to conflict. All these very important lessons you could you might call these soft skills um and how to create artwork and how to call a file so all these sort of practical things as well and that enabled me to understand what the design process is in a in a in a real world environment even though it was sheltered through education it was a very small job it was literally a business card that today would be very quick and that took me you know three months to do but i learned so much and i feel that these small um uh, be taken <coughs> in universities rather than and that's why i read that quote rather than um saying i'll oh, just learn it yourself um is universities could change i also think the system of uh british universities of marking and assessment and um you know double marking and this this idea of grading can you know colleagues people that i know that teach at these universities often say that they spend more time marking and double grading and assessing and feedback and blah, 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 than actually teaching the project and of course it's important to know where you stand. However, for me, it's very obvious if the work is not is good or not. And I don't think it needs to be necessarily graded in a kind of rigorous way. So it's not about your grade, it's about your work. And ultimately your work is gonna get you a job or get you some work when you leave university, not your grade. So I understand it's important. I understand that, you know, the client the, the cultural climate has changed uh students are now clients as as opposed to students so it's a different thing and universities are providing a service so that has changed massively in my lifetime uh i don't think it's changed for the better um but i feel that a shift towards combining design thinking design methodology with practical things because ultimately when you are out of university, you are asked to design something with content. You're not asked for your opinion on something or you're not asked to do whatever you want. So I think there's a big kind of gulf between the two. That's brilliant. If you had an unlimited amount of resources, how would you shape your, your own course? I would, I don't think you actually need unlimited resources. Um, I think what you need is a process of um, smaller numbers, which maybe is unlimited resources, so you need to employ more teachers. I think um, smaller numbers, uh, more, more uh, opportunities for tacit learning, more 
classes that involve uh, practical uh, and um, historical and theoretical teaching, especially of typography, uh, and really being able to have these conversations and have this sort of merging of all these things, these three things, historical, practical, theoretical, and for it to be a place where students can have their studio and to own and to have agency over. And I feel that that maybe could really, you know, inspire self-learning of students. You know, I know when, when I was, uh, when I was at Reading, I learned so much from my fellow colleagues, you know, two of my colleagues, uh, very well known, John Morgan, brilliant book designer, Stuart, but Bailey, brilliant book designer and writer and editor. So I, we learned so much together. So it's like, and we only learned that together because we were thrown together. We were really encouraged to be in the department because we didn't have a computer at home or a laptop. So we were kind of in a studio environment straight from the, straight from the go. So we weren't isolated. So sort of self-learning is very difficult if you're isolated. And I think this idea of learning together from your tutors and from your peers, um, is something that I would, uh, would encourage and bringing in, um, kind of real jobs or real assignments that are managed by, uh, tutors to kind of give students some, some protection to, you know, because it can be really brutal in, uh, in the design world, you know, it can be really brutal when you go for a pitch for a job and you don't get it, or, you know, you, a client doesn't like what you've done or you, you know, there's a problem, you know, often my job over the years has been to manage problems. What happens if the printer says I've messed it up or what happens if uh, they can't get the paper or what happens if uh, it can't be delivered or now, you know, the, the big thing now is, you know, the big problem is what happens if you're trying to deliver to a different country and no one knows what the rules are. And so all these kind of problems is about how to, manage these problems rather than uh, hide behind email you have to kind of try to predict them in the first place uh, that's really a job of a, of a of a designer maybe it's the job of anyone is, is is really sort of predicting what the problems can be and trying to sort them before they happen and you know i think maybe in universities where everyone's too nice to to the students and and uh like building up to be a, a kind of utopian world. Uh, and of course it can be, and I'm not saying it's when you're out in the real world, it's, it's uh, not good. It's just a different challenge. You know, I personally really enjoy that challenge because I enjoy the challenge of uh, doing something with other people's content. So, yeah, I think that's why I, I still, you know, and I'm really passionate about design, passionate about studio practice, passionate about teaching. And still think that, you know, design and typography has a massive relevance today. So I'm, I'm still here every day working on that. And I, and, and, I, and I sort of got this kind of love affair with, with graphic design, ultimately, that keeps me, keeps me going. Wonderful. How can our viewers and listeners find you? Yeah, good question. Well, of course, you can, you know, go to a bookshop, an art bookshop, and look at uh, in the colophon of many books that we've designed. Um, you obviously can look at our website. You can follow us on Instagram. We even have a YouTube, which we're very keen to get more subscribers because I think we only have under 50. Um, but we do have a lot of content. Uh, people can watch my PhD video on YouTube or you can see lots of talks and videos I've made. So do find out. You can obviously apply to the summer school when we do that. We're hoping to do one in 2024. Uh, go to a university that I teach at. Or just get in touch. You know, I'm very, uh, I'm very open. I'm very keen to meet people. If they, you know, I personally always have a uh, a policy that if 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 a young student rings me up on my on the studio phone, I feel that that's really brave, and I usually make an appointment to see them. 
And uh, so I suppose my message to students is don't be shy. Don't hide behind the email. Get involved. Come to a talk of mine. Come and say hello afterwards. Become part of a network and don't hide behind email. Wonderful. Which brings us to the last question is, is how, what advice would you like to leave us with? Except for that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I suppose, I suppose with students, with, with, you know, people at university, I, 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 my, my advice is, you know, get uh, engrossed in the subject, read about history, uh, read about theory, um, because it's really, it's really important to know what's happened before just in terms of style, visual culture and technology. And you can use all that knowledge in your work so you can justify choices. You can come up with ideas through that and also be engaged with the process. Work through the actual process, the design process of, of engaging with the content, making stuff. And that process involves, if you're making anything that is physical, involves printing it out. It involves testing, it involves looking at it, and really about this idea of training your eye. And it doesn't involve doing, you know, fake mock-ups. It involves real things. So, you know, even, even you know, if you're designing a website, the idea of that, obviously now, the last few years, the, the, the rise of Figma is great because it's a prototyping tool. You can send a prototype to your mobile. You can look at it on your mobile, on the bus. You can get out of your studio and see it in the environment. And I feel that that is uh, lacking now. And just this idea of working through the process and opening up that process to your clients and really opening up yourself really for criticism, uh, which is feel why people don't really want to get involved in the, in the process or expose their process. But to me, that journey, I always see graphic design as a journey. You're going on a road you might not be sure which road you're going or where you're going to end up. But you're always going to end up in a great place. And you go on that road with your client and with the content. You don't just specify where you're going to go. Good analogy. Wonderful. But I think it is. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. It was a real pleasure. No worries. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you.